I'm Brian Kiley. Uh, I've been coming to Shoreline since about 2016. Been a believer basically since I started coming to Shoreline, but definitely was not walking with Christ as I grew up. My famous sketch line was like, oh yeah, I, I love God and Jesus and I follow the commandments and stuff like that. <laughs> I'm, I'm good. That's about as deep as my faith went. Coming back to Christ was about 2015. I uh, had a best friend, Jordan at the time, and his dad, Gary, who are local, and they would pour into me all the time. He probably sowed seeds for about a year before I finally said, you know what, I think I wanna do a Bible study with you, and that's sort of where the journey began. I tried to immerse more of my daily routine in God, um, but I still think it took me quite a few years to really understand what the depth of relationship with Christ is like. And that honestly didn't really come until about 2021 when I went through a divorce and the things that I held highest in my life, my marriage, my ex-wife, um, my business at the time, these were all things that brought me joy and comfort. And when they all fell apart and got taken away, I realized I had nothing. Ultimately, I realized the last thing I could ever do in the circumstances I was in was run away from the person that had been chasing after me my entire life. And it was that moment where I went all in for Jesus. And it was since 2021 and walking through some of the hardest points of my life that I've ever lived that I actually realized to love is to suffer, to know Christ is to find joy and peace in the midst of the chaos and to just trust that he will use anything that you're going through or what I went through for my good and his glory. And my life has been so incredible ever since then. Yeah, I just love that quote that Brian shared, to know Christ is to find joy and peace in the midst of the chaos. Thank you, Brian, for sharing that with us. And thanks for sharing your story. Well, welcome to week four, Shoreline Church. We are so excited you're here. We are continuing on our sermon series, Three Words, where our sermon series, we're looking at God's plan for salvation through the lens of these epic three-word phrases. If you remember week one, we were in the beginning, and then we went week two, in the garden, and then last week, we were God with us. And what does that mean for us as we live our lives on a daily basis? And this week, since it's Palm Sunday, it's joyous, it's celebratory. We even had the Shoreline dance team up here. How amazing was that? I thought I should continue by playing a game. Would anybody like to play a game this morning, Shoreline Church? Yes, of course. So here's the name of my game. It's called, Who Is This? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you three clues for a historical figure. And then I want you to try to guess who is this. But I don't want you to shout it out as soon as you know the answer, if you think you know the answer. I want you to wait till the end, till all three clues are done, and then I want you to shout it out as loud as you can after I ask, who is this? And for those of you who are joining us online, if you are on one of our hosted platforms, you can actually go into the chat bar and put your, your what you, who you think this is. All right, you ready to go, Sherlock Church? Okay, here we go. Number one, who is this? Losing his father at age 11, he was raised by a single mother and never received a formal education. Okay, clue number two. He had two beloved dogs named Sweet Lips and Madame Moose. You got that yet? Number three. As a military commander, he actually lost more battles than he won. And in one battle alone, he had two horses shot out from under him and four bullet holes through his coat. Yet, he was miraculously never wounded. Okay, Shoreline Church, who is this? George Washington. George Washington the whole, they get it over here. All right, point for this side of the worship center. Amen. George Washington, exactly. I'll tell you what, I would not want to be in his horse or his coat. All right, here we go. Number two, who is this? At age five, his name was officially changed on his birth certificate by his father in honor of a German monk. At age 15, he skipped two grades and entered college, eventually earning his college degree at age 19 and a PhD by age 25. 
As a seminary student, he was elected student body president and graduated valedictorian of his class despite receiving a C grade in his public speaking class. All right, Shoreline Church, who is this? Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., exactly. How would you like to be his public speaking class professor? The guy that gave him a C in his public speaking class. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Yes, you got it, Shoreline. You're on a roll now. Here we go. Number three. Who is this? She was born of Albanian descent in Eastern Europe and chose to dedicate her life to full-time service to God at the age of 12. Okay, clue number two. During her first teaching assignment, she was given no supplies or equipment. Instead, she taught her students by writing in the mud with wooden sticks making use of what little resources she could get her hands on. Here we go, third clue. She received more than 120 honors and awards in her lifetime, including a Nobel Peace Prize in 1979. Shoreline Church, who is this? (laughs) Mother Teresa, exactly, you got it. Beautiful. Well, now for some of you, how many of you got all three right? All, all three right. Okay, you are officially the Shoreline Historians. We dub you Shoreline Historians. But for some of you, maybe didn't get any right. Here's your bonus. We all could get this right. Here we go. Bonus. Who is this? He created the universe and everything in it. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. In his name alone, every knee will one day bow before him. Shoreline Church, who is this? Jesus. You got it. Amen. Well, if you didn't guess our three words for today, who is this? Who is this? And that was the question that they were asking over 2,000 years ago in the original Palm Sunday on that first Palm Sunday. And so before we dive into our biblical text today, what I want to do, just set the stage a little bit. So Jesus and the disciples are on their, on their way to Jerusalem. And of course, they're going there leading into the week of Passover. And if you remember Passover, this was God's, t- when, when the people of Israel, the Jewish people, celebrated and commemorated God's deliverance of the people of Israel out of slavery, out of bondage in, in Egypt, okay? So that's Passover. And so this is a festival. And what that means is that people would make a pilgrimage every year to the temple in Jerusalem. And so the streets going into Jerusalem and the streets within Jerusalem would be jam-packed with people. In fact, historians at that time say that in that point of history, Jerusalem's normal population was only about 20,000 people. But during Passover week, it swelled to over 2 million people. That's 100 times the population. So you think we have it bad during car week. Jerusalem, a hundred times. So Jerusalem was jam-packed. The roads were filled. People were coming from all different directions. And Jesus knows what lies ahead, doesn't he? Jesus knows in the days ahead that he will be betrayed by one of his disciples. He will be abandoned by all of his disciples and closest friends. He will suffer and he will go to the cross. And Jesus knows what lies ahead. And up to this point, really before today in Jesus' ministry, he has kept his divine nature largely in secret from the public. Now, his disciples, he's made it clear who he is. He's made it clear what his mission is and those closest to Jesus. But in the public's eye, Jesus has kept it mostly a secret. And Bible scholars call that the messianic secret. But on this day, this Palm Sunday... Jesus announces who he is in grand fashion. He has a parade into Jerusalem, recognizing him as the king and Messiah. And this historic event, this historical event is actually recorded in all four Gospels. All four of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, record Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. So today we're going to really focus on Matthew chapter 21, and we're going to walk through the first 11 verses, 1 through 11, and we're going to see and learn about this historic event. All right, here we go. Ready to go? Shoreline Church, reading verse 1. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, go to the village ahead of you. 
And at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. He will send them right away. And this beautiful picture of Jesus right away in these first verses, what do we see? We see Jesus pulling back the veil of his divine secret, of this messianic secret. And what, how does he do that? He references the phrase, the Lord. And in Greek, that word is kyrios. And that word is used all throughout the New Testament referencing Jesus as the Messiah. And so Jesus doesn't tell his disciples, tell them Jesus needs it. Tell them the prophet needs it. Tell them that the teacher needs it. What does he say, church? He says, tell him the Lord needs it. Jesus is declaring right there that he is Lord. And so why did Jesus direct his disciples to do this? It seems kind of funny, doesn't it? Was Jesus tired on his journey to Jerusalem? We read in verse 4, This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, See, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. And so what's implied here in the text is that the disciples found it exactly as Jesus had said. They found the colt. They found the donkey exactly as Jesus had said. And we see here is this great prophecy that comes from the prophet Zechariah that was spoken 500 years earlier when God spoke through Zechariah. And there was this promise, a promise of a king, a Messiah that would come from heaven for Israel, for the nation of Israel. And so we read and we're reminded that this king, this king would come gently and he would come humbly, not filled with pride or arrogance, but he would be a gentle and humble king. We also read here that this would be a king who would come riding on a donkey, not on a war horse. Now, if you don't understand the historical context, it's really important that we do, Shoreline, because at that time of history, the donkey was a symbol of peace. Specifically, if you had two two nations that were at war, and the kings would come together, maybe under a flag of truce, And one of the kings came, and from a distance, the king looks, and he sees this king coming, and the king is riding on a donkey. Guess what that meant to the other king? He's coming in peace. He's coming to negotiate peace. Jesus came in peace, the king on a donkey. And we also read that this king would be riding on the foal or a colt of a donkey, And that's important because the colt, as we learn in John 12, which gives us further clarity on this, Jesus would ride on this colt, a colt that had never been ridden. And again, ancient Israel in that culture, that animal that had never been ridden had been set aside for a specific purpose. And here we have this colt that's never been ridden before. And Jesus rides on that colt. Jesus knew this prophecy, didn't he? He knew the prophecy, and what is he doing? He's living it out publicly now. He's living it out. And Jesus knew when he stepped up and he mounted that colt and he got on that colt, Jesus knew that he was lighting the fuse. He was lighting the fuse that would erupt the end of the week and would lead him to the cross. Because he knew the religious leaders, the political zealots, and the people who expected this king to come conquer, they would not be satisfied, and they wouldn't be happy. And Jesus was publicly declaring this prophecy. He said, I am the Messiah. I am him. The one that you've waited for all these years, I'm here. And Jesus announced that publicly. And so how would the people then that are on the route to Jerusalem, how would they respond to this, knowing this prophecy, seeing Jesus live it out? We read in verse 8, a very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, 
while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. See, the people erupted to Jesus' arrival. And what did they do? They got their cloaks. They took out their cloaks and they took their cloaks that they had. And remember, back in ancient times, they didn't have a whole closet full of cloaks, did they? They probably had one cloak and they were on a pilgrimage and they were wearing it. And so what did they do? They took this cloak and they threw it. They laid it on the road in front of Jesus as Jesus was coming. And then they had palm. We know later on in John chapter 12 that the branches come from palm trees. And what did they do? They laid these palm branches. They laid them on the road. They laid them on the road. Now, why did they do that? Was it to get so that, that Jesus' feet and the donkey's feet didn't get dusty? There's powerful symbolism here. First, the cloaks. The cloaks actually were a symbol of submission and a recognition of royalty. And so when they laid their cloaks down, they were acknowledging Jesus as the king and they were submitting their lives to him. They were demonstrating their loyalty to this king. And the palm branches, the palm branches were actually a symbol of Passover and they were also a national symbol of victory for the nation of Israel. And so what they were proclaiming that day when Jesus came is loyalty to Jesus, loyalty to the king, and Jesus Christ is the Messiah. He is the king of kings. And the closest thing I can think of to this demonstration of, and symbolism is if you went to a 4th of July parade, let's say you go to New York City, 4th of July, our National Independence Day, and there's this big, massive parade coming down. And you're standing on the side. And all along the side, there's little children out there with their little flags, and they're waving them. There's American patriotic music playing. And then here comes the flag. The color guard comes down the middle. And everybody stands as the flag comes. And you look, and there's these veterans. World War II, Korean War, Vietnam War, Afghanistan, Iraq, veterans of all ages, active duty military. And what do they do? They all stand, and they do this. They snap that salute up there. They're acknowledging that's Independence Day. Shoreline, this was Israel's Independence Day. This was their Independence Day parade, acknowledging that the Messiah had come. And the other part of this, which we sang earlier, this beautiful song, Hosanna, we see in verse 9. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. And these are songs of blessing that have very powerful meaning. Just that phrase, Hosanna, it means saves. It's short for God saves. And it's a cry for deliverance. A deliverance, it's a cry. And then we see also the son of David. And if you remember from the Old Testament, we know that the Messiah comes from the lineage of King David. And also they were saying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So the crowds were acknowledging Jesus as the Messiah and the honors that he is due. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And they were crying for deliverance from what? Crying for deliverance from oppression. Remember, Israel was under the rule of Rome at that time. And so they were expecting that Jesus would come as their deliverer. This was their Independence Day. And Hosanna, which was their rally cry. That was their rally cry for deliverance. And we read in verse 10, when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, who is this? Now, that word stirred, it's actually a Greek word, sio, and it means stirred like an earthquake, to be shaken up, to be agitated. And so what do we learn here is that Jerusalem was at a fever pitch. Jerusalem was in an uproar. And why were they in that? Because Jesus had come. And people were asking that question, who is this? Who is this? So we see the answer in verse 11. The crowds answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. And so church, 
were they saying, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth? Or were they saying, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth? Now, Shoreline, we don't know the tone, do we? We don't know the tone. But what do we know? Nazareth was not considered a very good place. In fact, Nazareth was not a place where any self-respecting Jew would come from, let alone the Messiah. In fact, it was one of Jesus' own disciples. You remember Nathaniel? John chapter 1. Nathaniel, one of his disciples, said this, Nazareth, can anything good come from there? And so there was disbelief. There was unbelief. So what we do know is this, though. To answer that question, who is this? Jesus came publicly declaring publicly that he is the awaited Messiah. Those prophecies that had been all throughout the centuries in the Old Testament. Over 600 different prophecies pointed to the Messiah. Second, Jesus came as the peaceful king. The peaceful king. He came not to make war, but to bring peace. And Jesus came as the humble servant. He came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Mark 10, 45. And sadly, Jesus was not who or what they were expecting. When we read that, verse 11, it's almost like we can hear the disappointment in their voices, can't we? We can hear the disappointment. Because they were expecting a powerful national deliverer. That's what they were expecting. And why would they expect that? The verse right after Zechariah 9, Zechariah 9.10, listen to what that says. I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. You see, they were expecting a powerful national deliverer, like it says right here. But what they didn't realize is that Jesus did come, Zechariah 9.9, as the humble servant king. And that this verse, this part of prophecy, he will come. He will come again as a conquering king to make peace. Jesus will come, make no doubt. But at that time, He was not who or what they were expecting. That's because Jesus didn't come as a conquering king, ready to make war, but he came as a humble servant, a humble servant prepared to make peace. And that peace is the ultimate peace that Jesus on the cross would allow us to be forgiven for our sins and to have peace with God. And that would not only extend to the people of Israel, but to all nations. Jesus Christ, the one who came in peace, the one who the crowds yelled for. So on Sunday, on that Palm Sunday, they were screaming, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. But many in that crowd by Friday would be screaming, crucify him. Crucify him. Crucify him. Jesus knew. Jesus knew that he was not what they wanted or who they wanted. But he knew he was the only solution for what they needed. See, they wanted a conqueror. But he came as a servant. And they wanted to make war, to overthrow the Romans. And Jesus came to give us peace. And they wanted everything to go their way. And Jesus said, no, no, no. This is the only way. It's my way. Jesus, our King of kings, our Lord of lords, and the Messiah. And so as we've done every week during our sermon series, we have actually sat down and we've asked some life-changing questions. 
And so what I want to do today, Shoreline, I want to change it up a little bit on you. I want to change it up on you. I want to ask you just one life-changing question. Just one question today. And here's the question. Who is Jesus to you? Who is Jesus to you? And that's essentially the question that Jesus asked Peter and his disciples. In Matthew 16, verse 15, Jesus said, But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? And earlier, if you remember, the disciples say, well, some say you're John the Baptist, some say you're, you're Elijah, some say you're Jeremiah, some say you're all the other prophets. And then Jesus looks straight at Peter and says, but who do you say I am? That question, who is Jesus to you, is the most important question that we'll ever be asked in our life. And how we answer that question will determine the direction of your life and your eternity. Who is Jesus to you? And if you're a follower of Jesus today, you've placed your faith in Jesus Christ at some point in your life, you know that Jesus is the leader and the Lord of your life. And you are trusting him, you're following him, and by the Holy Spirit living in you, you are walking and growing to be more like Jesus every day. Amen. And we can celebrate that. But some of you either here on campus today or maybe even watching online, you're not yet a follower of Jesus. And you'd say, yeah, Jesus is an important historical figure. I recognize that. Yeah, Jesus is a, a strong moral teacher. Or you'd say, oh, Jesus is yeah, he's this guy that made a big impact because he did a lot of good things in his life. And if you ask me this question on September 8th, 1990, I would have agreed with the latter. I would have said, absolutely, Jesus is an important historical figure. He's a good man who taught good moral values. And that's what I believed. But the next day, my wife shared the gospel of Jesus Christ. And on that day, I opened my heart for the first time in my life, I realized who is Jesus and what he did for me and what he promises for me. And so in our hot little tiny house, little duplex that we rented in Onalaska, Wisconsin, September 9th, 1990, I bowed my knee and gave my life to Jesus Christ, the leader of my life and the Lord of my life. And that changed the direction of my life. Amen to Jesus. It changed the trajectory of my life. It changed my eternity. Less than a year later, that fresh faith was challenged. You see, after I gave my life to Jesus, my wife Amy and I and our, our small children, we had three children at the time, ages two, five, and seven, and we found a local church. We got connected in that local church, and there was these, this Bible school, uh, there was a Sunday school class that was taught by these two medical doctors who also had the gift of teaching, Dr. Mark Young and Dr. Tom Zerbrigan. And they would teach us, and I just was loving the Bible, came to love that and go to church and experience that. But less than a year later, it's late August, 1991. I'm lying on the couch in that same two-bedroom duplex. I've got my knee up on a pillow. It's wrapped in ice and an ace bandage. I'm looking at my children. I'm holding my two-year-old daughter in my arms. And I'm looking at my five-year-old and my seven-year-old that are standing right there next to me. And they got tears running down their eyes because they see the tears of pain in dad's eyes. And I'm looking at my wife, Amy, and she has a look of concern in her eyes. And you're saying, what happened, Sean? What happened? Well, earlier in the day, I left the house with so much excitement. See, I had just gotten back from summer training. I was a, in my final year. I'd gotten my degree. I was ready. I got my commission in the United States Army. I was getting ready to go back on active duty. I was going to report to my officer basic course 10 days from that date. My life was set. My dreams were ahead. I was going to live out my lifelong dream to be an Army officer. My family they were excited for the move. The movers were coming that next week. Everything was ready to go. 
But I left that day, I went at the invitation of a friend of mine to play on the church basketball team in the City League Championship. And I loved basketball. I played two years in college. I loved it. So off I went. 16 seconds left to go in the game. I suffered a catastrophic knee injury. And we'd find out later on that three of the four ligaments that hold our knee together completely sheared. The cartilage completely destroyed. When I left that day, it was filled with excitement. When I came home that day, they had to carry me in the door. They had to help me onto the couch because I couldn't walk. This is not what I was expecting. But later that afternoon, there was a knock on the door, and it was Dr. Mark Yunk, our Sunday school teacher. And he'd heard what happened, and he came, and he kneeled down beside me, and he's a general practitioner, right? He's a general, and he looked at the knee, and he knew it was not good. And so he laid his hand on me, began to pray, and he left. And when he left, even though I was filled with despair, I was filled with pain and anxiety, not knowing what lied ahead, there was a sense of peace that it was going to be okay. And the Holy Spirit, as the Holy Spirit only does, nudged, just this gentle nudge in my heart. And these are the words that I heard. Don't give up. Don't give up. Because just as Jesus was on the move on that Palm Sunday, way back 2,000 years ago, Jesus was already on the move in my life. The next morning, we got a call from the top orthopedic surgeon's office in La Crosse, Wisconsin. And they said, hey, Dr. Yunk recommended to the doctor that she take you on as a patient. And so that next day, they had an opening. I got to go in. I got to see the top orthopedic surgeon. And she said, your knee is so damaged, we're going to operate this Friday. Is that okay with you? And not only that, but my report date was 10 days away. And you know how the Army was back then. If you didn't show up ready to go or at least had a surgery that says, I'm ready to go, I would have been disqualified medically. And my professor of military science called the school in Fort Huachuca, Arizona, and got my report date delayed for two extra weeks. And in that two weeks, I was able to have the surgery, I was able to report late, and our little tiny family, we loaded up in our Toyota Camry, and with me in the back seat with my knee straight up between the seats, ice pack on it, a child on either side, and our seven-year-old son, the navigator seat of my wife, we embarked down to Arizona. And God was on the move as well when we got there. Because when we got there, there was a pastor and his wife and their family who heard about our situation, and they took us in under their wing. They provided for us a place for us to live, a place for me to continue to grow. And not only that, but when I got there, the commander of the school said, hey, we see what you're going through. We're going to have a delay. We're not going to have you start class until January. Will that give you enough time to heal, to do the physical therapy you need? The answer was yes. And so as I learned back then, I have to trust Jesus, and I have to follow Jesus and not give up because he made a way then, and he made a way, and he still makes a way today, amen? And so my three words to live it out for each one of us today is don't give up. Don't give up. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what your life looks like right now. But God does. And I suspect for many here or many online today, there's something in your life that is really causing you to be tempted to give up. And today the message is this, don't give up. Don't give up. Maybe you're facing seemingly insurmountable challenges like I was back in August of 1991. Maybe it's health or maybe it's financial or maybe it's relational. I don't know, but don't give up. Don't give up. Maybe your marriage or maybe your family, it seems like it's falling apart. And Jesus says, don't give up. 
Keep praying for him. Keep loving him. Keep extending grace. Or maybe there's somebody in your life that doesn't yet know Jesus Christ or they've wandered away or they've walked away from walking with Jesus. Jesus says, oh, mom, oh, dad, oh, grandpa, oh, grandma, oh, brothers, sisters, friends, don't give up on them. Don't give up. And for some of you, if you're not yet a follower of Jesus, you're watching today. Don't give up on seeking Jesus. Don't give up on keeping your heart open to Jesus. And for all of us, don't give up on Jesus. Don't give up on him. And why is that? He didn't give up on us. He didn't give up on us. Jesus, on that Palm Sunday, think about this. He could have not even gotten on to the colt's back. Jesus could have chose to get off the colt's back at any point on his journey to Jerusalem. Jesus could have stayed on that colt and just kept riding through Jerusalem. But he didn't. He chose to go the distance for you and I. He didn't give up on us. The Bible says that for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame. The joy that was set before him was to please the Father, to return to the glory of heaven, and to bring many sons and daughters to glory. You are that glory if you're his follower. His desire is for you to come to know him. Jesus didn't give up on us. And we shouldn't give up on him. So three words. In the beginning. In the garden. God with us. And now today, the question, who is this? And the answer is Jesus. The only hope and solution for us, for today and for all eternity. Amen? Amen. So, Lord Jesus, we thank you for your goodness. Jesus, we thank you that you did not give up on us, that you went from the cult to the cross and taking upon yourself our sin and offering the perfect sacrifice for that sin. And Jesus, out of that, we know, Jesus, that you love us deeply and that you have a plan and a purpose for us. And so no matter what we're walking through today, Jesus, we can trust in you, we can follow you, and we can continue to find our hope in you. And so, Jesus, we love you, and we commit the rest of our day and our life to you. And we pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. God bless. I have a couple of quick announcements for you. Uh, if you are a follower of Jesus, you have surrendered your life to Jesus, you've accept, accepted that gift of his death and resurrection for your sins, and you haven't yet been baptized, we want to invite you to a baptism class today at 1230. It'll be in the garden room. Uh, we'd love to have you join us with Pastor Roy and to hear a little bit more about baptism and what it means. Uh, we're going to be having a baptism at our next night of worship in April. That's Wednesday, the first Wednesday of April. If you... Uh, have not yet done so, we would love to have you pick up some of these little invitation cards. They're out in uh, the lobby as you go out. They have them in the Connection Center. These are to show other people. These are to give to other people to invite them. You'll see our, our two Good Friday times on there, and we've got three Easter service times. We'd love to have you come, but we'd also love to have you invite somebody else. So grab a card, grab a handful of cards, and please invite some people this week. As always, if you need prayer, 
We'd love to have you come up front here in the worship center. If you're online, your host would love to pray for you. Uh, or you can send an email to prayer at shoreline.church. Well, we would love to join you in praying for something that's going on in your world. And if you've never been to our Connection Center, whether today's your first day or you've been coming here for years, we invite you to go by the Connection Center. Learn more about our church. Find out how you can get involved, ways that you can serve, ways that you can learn, how you can grow. Um, they'd love to give you a little gift there. If you're online, you can text Text the word welcome to the number that's on your screen. And finally, if you would so indulge me, I would love to send you off with a word of blessing, whether you're here or at home, if you could stand. It is our prayer that you go today with a renewed sense of the answer to the question, who is this? Walk in the profound truth that God loves you, that Jesus came to live a perfect life, to die for your sins to resurrect on Easter Sunday, the celebration we have just this week. Walk in that truth knowing that there is hope and there is goodness out in this world through Jesus. God bless you. We hope to see you on Friday. Right.